joining us tonight for the last of our uh, Lane County Master Gardener seminar series. Um, just a couple days ago, I had a chance to talk with a couple of uh, other Master Gardeners about how well this appears, at least to me, to have gone in terms of our speakers and all of our attendees being so willing to be flexible and uh, switch to Zoom. And tonight um, we have Mark Bloom from Bloom River Gardens um, up the Mackenzie River. And in the background helping out is his wife Val. And um, they have been real troopers because uh, up the Mackenzie, they of course, the, the fire last month got within a couple of miles of the nursery. Uh, and this is also their busy time of the year with shipping. And um, earlier this evening, their internet went out. So Mark and Val have moved all the plants to their kitchen. And um, I'm only mentioning all of this because I really appreciate this kind of effort. And, and our speakers have all been like this this year, really helping us out. So Mark, uh, whoops, um, has, uh, was born and raised in the Willamette Valley, has been in the nursery business since 1965 and had his own business since 1978. Um, and Val works with him. So it's a family owned nursery. Some of you may be familiar with it up the Mackenzie River. And um, what Mark's gonna talk with us about tonight are, is using conifers in our gardens. So if you would, please put any questions as they come to your mind in the q a i will keep an eye on that we'll stop kind of midway along to answer questions and then we'll stop again at the end uh, and take any additional questions that have come along so uh, please put your questions in the q a i'll keep an eye on it and um one quick note just to let everyone know this is the last seminar for this year but we are still very interested in getting ideas from any of you for topics or speakers that you think would be good for next year. So that's it from me. It's yours, Mark. Thank okay. you for coming this evening. Okay, thanks very much. Now, does this actually show me? <laughs> yes. Yeah, I haven't done one of these before, so this is new to me also. So um, there we go, okay. I actually am going to start with a little bit of nomenclature so people have an idea of what I'm speaking of. So uh, I'm just going to mention the genus of species, the cultivar, and what I mean by that. So I'm going to hold up a tag. Let's grab, uh, let's grab this one right here. And now I'm not being shown at the large screen. Is that uh, how this is supposed to work? Am I supposed to be in the large screen? Hopefully. I'm not in That's the large how you would uh, just sorry to interrupt, Mark. If you can, Val, look for a, a way to make your the screen the speaker screen. And then once I'm quiet and Mark talks, you okay. should be the big screen. What does that say? Share screen. That's a share no, screen. No, 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 not speaker share screen. View. Okay. Speaker well, view. Okay. Speaker view. Do you even see well, that? Did you did you talk about that gallery? The gallery view, view shows everybody. Okay, so it should now have you as the big image. It's no. who's ever talking. So Mark, you're big to us. So example, okay. for example, I'm talking right now, but my screen right. shows you in the big screen. Okay, so all right. That's unfortunate for you that it's gonna be hard for you to see. Um, kind of what you look at, but we all see you on on. Oh, okay, okay. So, okay. so how right. close do we have to hold the no, tag? Can can people can people see this? Yeah, Tuga okay. Condensius. Pardon? It's Tuga Condensius. Okay, good, good. Okay, <laughs> so what I wanted to explain with this as I go through these different conifers is, hopefully, I got tags written for all of them uh, as they're assembled here in the kitchen, and. Uh, I wanted to explain real briefly what we have. The genus is the first word, uh, the species is the second, and then the third third word or words is the what's called the cultivar. And what that means with conifers is that someone has found a mutation or what's called a sport. 
some kind of variant from the parent plant. And that's the part that's in parentheses. If it was a straight species, such as this one, Fitzroya cupersoides, you don't see anything in those two little, what are they called, asterisks or whatever it is. There's no name beyond Fitzroya cupersoides. And that tells you that that's a native plant somewhere. In this case, it's a native to South America. So as I go through talking about each one of these, I'll hold up that tag so you have an idea of what it is I'm talking about. And what I, what I wanted to start with, oh, as, as, let me add one more thing to that. Um, in some plants, you'll, you'll see a genus, but you won't see a species at all. Uh, and what that usually indicates is there's a cross, and that's a human interaction, uh, such as rhododendron Cynthia, something like that. Uh, and what that means is that's been hybridized, uh, so it's got human hands on it, so they dropped this, the uh, species part, they just had the genus. But with conifers, it's extremely rare to have a cross. There are a few native crosses that occur in nature, but for the most part, almost every different kind of conifer is someone finding a mutation or a sport and propagating that either vegetatively or by grafting it and forming that name. And then they name it for, you know, whatever, Morris Midget, um, actually that's a boxwood, uh, Morris Weeping, uh, which is obviously the name of a individual who found it or they name it for their daughter or whatever be the case or for what it looks like. Uh, so that's, um, that's what I want you to be aware of. So if there are any questions as we roll into this, you can, you can, uh, you can ask a question and say, you know, you were talking about this plant, could you tell me more about it? So the first thing I wanted to start with, or second thing I wanted to start with, is you have an idea that you want to put a conifer in your landscape. And of course, some of the first things we want to consider is conifers come in lots of different sizes and shapes uh, and colors and textures. I think currently in the last, uh, the last uh, article I read, there are currently 27,000 different kinds of cultivars. So there's, there's a lot of selections, but I will say, you know, we do about I'm gonna say about 600 different kinds of conifers. It'd be rare to find a nursery that does many more than that. So there's lots of different ones worldwide, but many of them only exist in someone's garden. They found in, you know, they found out in the woods, that kind of thing. So if, so I, I'm just gonna start with my hands and saying that conifers come very perpendicular like an arbovita, so it's something really straight up and down. And then there's also conifers that are more columnar, and then they start going outwards and to a point they become pyramidal, and then eventually they even become flat. And so there's all those different shapes to consider when, you have, when you're thinking about a conifer in a particular setting. Uh, the other thing is a texture. If it's going to be planted near a sidewalk or near a driveway, it's best not to have something that's prickly. Um, if I'm going off camera a bit, where am I? Oh, right here. Sorry about that. Certainly, we would not want to plant a monkey puzzle next to a driveway. <laughs> and the ironic thing about this is, is this is what happened. This is how I obtained this plant. I got a call from a gentleman who said several years ago, I planted an Araucaria monkey puzzle next to our driveway that was right next to the bus stop. And several years later, the county called him and said, you need to move that plant. And so I got a call and we dug it up and moved it. Uh, but obviously texture and these things are very prickly. You know, the old monkey puzzle concept is the monkey was able to go up the tree, but he couldn't go back down. That's where that term came from. 
So if you're planning next to a walkway, you want to have something soft. And a, an example of that would be, in fact, I showed this before. This is a very small one. Oops, wrong plant here. Very small one here. This is Suga canadensis Coles prostrate. Stays low, uh, stays very low actually, just pretty much creeps on the ground, very soft texture. There's lots, there's currently about 2,500 different forms of Canadian hemlock available, at different cultivars. So there's a lot of them. This one stays flat on the ground, but there's a lot of them that are more upright. Again, it'd be a good one that's going to be planted next to a walkway. And obviously, then we go from there, if it's going to become more of a focal point, uh, you know, then you can go with a variety of shapes. So you could have it be columnar, you could have it even be pyramidal if it has room, if it has good air circulation all the way around it. Uh, one of the drawbacks with, with getting a conifer that's gonna be butt up against the side of a building is that that backside is gonna die out. Uh, conifers, as a general rule, need good air circulation all the way around to prevent, for, prevent that die out. Um, unfortunately, there are some conifers that get that die out anyway uh, because they get shaded by the growth in front of them and uh, you know, that, that dies back. So once you've selected a shape that you want, um, you might look at the color that, you're, that you want, if it's gonna be a gold color, such as this one right here. And I can just show you the tip of this. This is a, actually a form of Western red cedar called Forever Goldie. And, and the four is just like, just like that, you'll see it, the actual name has the numerical four in it, Forever Goldie. So a, 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 a Western Red Cedar. By the way, the placata is, uh, refers to the placatic acid that Western Cedars give off. If you've ever wondered why your plants don't grow well under a mature Western Red Cedar, it's because of the pl placatic acid that poisons the soil. And then of talking about, so you have a, um, a color, I mean, obviously that's very gold, that actually has, a, that particular plant actually gets some orange highlights in the winter. It's a very nice selection. Other narrow selections that would be possibly good as a hedge material. Uh, this, is, this is very popular because this is the one that smells like um, lemon. This is a uh, Wilma Goldcrest. Always really popular at Christmas time. There we go. It's Cupressus macrophylla, macrocarpa, Wilma Goldcrest. And now there is one, uh, Cupressus macrocarpa, macrocarpa Goldcrest, with no Wilma in there. And that one grows tall, but it actually gets quite wide. Uh, now, do keep in mind, Wilma does get up in the air. We ended up taking ours out when it got to about 12 feet. So it's not a small growing conifer, but it does stay narrow. Another selection, this is another cupressus. This is actually a cross between cupressus and leylandi. And this is called gold rider. Uh, it gets a little wider, it does get upright. Um, and as long as I had that leylandi part there, I'm going to talk about that. Lots of people love planting Leylandi cypresses as hedge plants. If you've got a narrow border, I would not plant a Leylandi. They will grow, yes, they're fast, and they will grow four and five feet a year. But keep in mind, they also grow four and five feet horizontally. Uh, I have seen, in fact, we planted a, um, a form called uh, Naylor's Blue. Uh, fortunately, it's in an area that has lots of room and its trunk is just about as big as this table. It's probably two feet thick. 
is probably 40 feet high, and I'm going to say maybe 30 feet wide. So not a plant that you want to put in a narrow area for a hedge. Uh, it's best, uh, and there's some wonderful uh, uses for it in hedges, but recommendation is 10 foot centers um, and go from that, but they need lots of room. Uh, otherwise, uh, you're gonna be cutting them back uh, really soon. I just saw a planting of it just the other day where they had planted it three feet on center. Okay. The other one, this gets to be kind of a broad upright. This is called Thuyopsis, Thuyopsis dolabrata vergata. And they'll get about 12, 15 feet, about six feet wide. So it's a pretty bulky upright. And it is, this form is variegated. I've had this in shade, so it's not showing a lot of that. This is sometimes called the elk horn cypress. Uh, really, uh, what would I call it? Um, um, not convoluted, uh, but bold foliage. Makes a nice bold. And then this one is a, um, da, 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 get my tag out, <laughs> Orientalis, Thuya Orientalis Jane Gold, right there. This makes a nice hedge plant. It is nice and gold, gold and green, but it has a, certainly a gold overcast to it. If, you, if you're, and probably the last one, and, and certainly the most common, if you're, if you're thinking of the, a green hedge, narrow upright, uh, certainly the strong recommendation is to go the emerald green arbabida. I would stay away from the old pyramidalis. Uh, it does have a tendency to get dye back in it, uh, has kind of a gray green color in the winter. Uh, emerald green, as the name implies, um, stays a really nice dark green. You know, you could even plant a emerald green as a solitary tree. Um, you know, they'll get eventually about 25 feet, very narrow pointed uh, uh, growth habit uh, when they're left on their own. And as far as placement, excuse me, as far as um, spacing, there is a real tendency for individuals wanting an instant hedge. Uh, I would strongly recommend if you're planting emerald green arborvitaes that you go three feet apart. Uh, that gives that plant a little bit of room. Uh, it's not going to touch immediately, but the plant overall will be a lot happier. When they're grown really tight together, they do get die out uh, and they, it puts them under a little bit of stress. And that's where you start to see some spider mite getting in is when trees are getting uh, you know, overcrowded and get stressed. So I would recommend that you plant them a little further apart. Okay. Um, I think probably one of the most port important things when you're going to a nursery and you're working with that nursery individual that um, uh, is trying to sell you something, obviously, and that same might be true here. Uh, but how tall or how big is that plant going to get? Um, something I'm asked about often is, you know, what is the ultimate size of that plant? Well, as long as the plant is healthy, in fact, maybe even if it's only half healthy, as long as it has nutrients, as long as it has water, it is going to grow and put on growth every year until it dies. We stop growing. You know, we get up to six feet and unfortunately sometimes we shrink, shrink after that. But plants, as long as they are alive, will continue to grow. So the better thing to ask is how much is that plant going to grow a year? And if they say, or if the tag says uh, six inches a year, uh, in fact, it's, uh, real commonly it will say how many inches a year and then it is say mature size, or maybe it just says mature size. So the mature size 
is what the plant does in 10 years. Uh, I have heard some nurseries are now scaling that back to what it does in seven years. Um, it's extremely rare that you find on a plant tag what it's going to do throughout its lifetime. If that was listed, a lot of retail nurseries would go out of business uh, because you're not going to want to hear that that small little plant you that you picked up. Let me uh, grab one that would work with that. Um, well, actually, let's see, that one already did. Yeah, just, well, actually, this one right here. I can do this one right here. I, of course, I don't have a tag. Okay, this is a Camicifera specifera uh, called Baby Blue Ice. Uh, and you can see this is about two years old that you're seeing right here. So after about 10 years, they're rated at about three to four feet. But after 20 years, they're going to be eight to 10 feet, et cetera, et cetera. So it's grow going to grow. It's classified as a dwarf. Uh, and dwarf only means, with conifers, it only means how much it grows a year. Yeah, that'd be a good one. So conifers, of course, this one is a pine. A ponderous. And this is our native ponderosa pine, and it grows fast. So it easily will put on 18 inches a year. Um, so it's a nice, let me put this, get this tag out for you here, Pinus ponderosa, that's what that is. So the better thing to ask where you're buying your plant is how much is this plant going to grow a year? And then you can extrapolate from that. Uh, the same, whether, that's, whether that's gonna hold true, whether the plant's gonna grow up or whether it's gonna go out, is how fast does it grow a year? With conifers, growth habits or growth rates are divided into four areas. Uh, you have a miniature, which is less than three inches a year. <laughs> This would be a miniature. This is two years old, by the way. This is Sugu, Suga canadensis jervis, right there. We have one in the garden that's about 20, I'm gonna say 25 years old. And I don't, it might be three by three. And I'm, I'm not sure it's even that. So again, you kind of extrapolate. This, this is a classified as a miniature. So it's less than three inches a year. Then dwarfs are classified as, you know, about three. Well, that's another, okay, this is another little miniature. This is a new little Piscea abies. It's unnamed at this point, but this is two years old. So this gives you an idea that some conifers are extremely slow growing. Um, I got this uh, cutting from a conifer collector. His old one, I think he said it was 25 years old. It was maybe eight inches, six by eight inches. So extremely slow growing. Now this little guy, this is, believe it or not, a form of Hanoki cypress, uh, just like uh, Nana gracilis uh, or Nana. Um, very congested foliage. It is classified as a dwarf. So it grows six, typically more than three inches, six inches, you know, six to eight inches, somewhere in there. Uh, it does get pretty big, uh, but, you know, if you don't want it to get really big, what you can do is clip those off and it will keep it shorter. You know, people, oh, I'm sorry, uh, people always, freak out when I do that, but this is Camisiparus obtusa shiroman. Um, and there's another Habari, I believe is another name for that. It's the same plant. It is very unique with that congested foliage. Again, six, eight inches a year. So we have an old one that's about seven feet tall. Um, let's just do, let's just do this one. That's another really nice obtusa. Hanoki cypress, I'm, yeah, Camisiparus obtusa aurora. This is being grown in full sun. You will see not a speck of burning on that. 
Um, and it's, I have a really old one, I'm gonna say maybe 15 years old that might be two feet high, two by two feet. So a really nice, slow Hanoki. Pardon? So, there we go, right there. That's Aurora. Okay. Focal point, let's see here. Um, Anyway, that I think that's really important to remember that on that growth rate. If you know, if you were to leave here, it, I would want you to remember that more than anything else is that growth rate. Uh, much more important than reading a tag that says mature growth, because we tend to think that it's going to get six feet high and it's going to stop. And I've actually gotten into arguments with people. Uh, I, I had a woman several years ago drop by and she said, you know, you sold me a plant about 20 years ago and it's 20 feet tall and it was a dwarf. And I said, well, I said, uh, let's extrapolate that. I said, uh, dwarf or intermediate maybe. And she said, it puts on about a foot a year. And I said, well, that's about right. 20 years, it'd be 20 feet. So that's the thing to consider is how how much growth it puts on a year, much more so than the 10 year growth or the mature size is, is how much it grows a year. Uh, and if you like things that are really low in spreading, this is a conifer from New Zealand. It is hardy in this, well, it, you know, it, it, it does suffer a bit when it gets down to zero, I will say. I think it's rated as a zone eight. This is Microcachus tetragona. And again, it's a straight species, straight uh, uh, genus and species. So this is not a selection, it's not a cultivar. Neat thing with this, stays right on the ground. So it's a really nice conifer that's going to creep over edges. We have one on a slope that goes down and it gets these very tiny, red cones on it that are only about maybe a quarter of an inch. And they are red and tetragona means it's four sides. Although I haven't looked that close to it, it's supposed to be a four sided cone. And then as the cones age, they turn brown, but it's a very attractive uh, little conifer. And as you can see how it's spread out here. Since we've had to move from the uh, setting in the shop, um, maybe a little haphazard here. Another low growing conifer. Uh, this is called Morris Dwarf. This is a uh, canadensis, Suga canadensis. Again, the soft foliage, you can see how strictly cascading it is. Morris Dwarf, obviously found by a guy by the name of David Morris. Yeah, take this thing. Grab this, one. this is another really choice. This one is about three years old now, three to four years old. This is, believe it or not, a Korean fir. One of the slowest growing Korean firs. It's called Abis coriana cis, right there. And just gets to be a low, dense mound. Really dark foliage. I do like the parvofloras. These are pines. These are uh, different forms of this. Uh, last I checked, there's about 250 different kinds, different selections, different mutations of um, Pinus parvoflora. Um, this is the slowest growing one. This is one called Reginhold. And the guy's last name, by the way, is Reginhold, who found this one. Yeah, oop, the part of the lettering is gone there, but this is Pinus parviflora reginhold. You also sometimes see it sold at Re as reginhold's broom, which is not correct, but that's the way it goes. Anyway, seven, eight years old, tiny, tiny little tufts. You can see where the graft is here. Could you bring over the taller reginhold? 
in the middle there, right there. Yeah. Right, in, right in the middle, the tall one, right there, yeah. I wanted to show you something on this. Since it's slow, it's so slow growing, this is one, hopefully I can get the whole thing in here. This is called a standard. A standard is when a, a conifer, sometimes with rhododendrons too, when they're grafted high. So you can see this has formed a, there's a trunk right here and then it's grafted up here. So there is not gonna be any foliage right here. This is gonna just typically stay as a trunk. And this is Reginhold also, same age as the other one, but grafted up high. I really like these, they're, they're not real popular out here, unfortunately, but they're very popular in the Midwest and the East Coast. And I really think one of the reasons is because they have a lot more snow back there. And these are something that kind of peek up through the snow. Also, I've, I've wondered sometimes uh, if it's planted near a roadway where they always get that salt spray, spray from the uh, ice trucks, if these are something that survive that kind of environment. I don't know that for a fact, but they are a popular on the, on the uh, like I said, the Midwest East Coast. And uh, we do about 50 different kinds of standards. And that particular plant, that trunk, as I said, will always stay bare. It eventually just gets larger and larger and the head will slowly get larger and larger. Um, I actually have a uh, Picea sachensis papoose um, that uh, has been grafted as a standard. If you're familiar with papoose, think now it's the prickly one right there. Here? Yep. Right that right, no, no, right there, yeah. And she touched it. And it was prickly. <laughs> if our Pisces chances. Maybe you should just hold it in front yeah, of you. So. See her, if you can see that, that's Pisces chances. Um, and this form is called papoose, but it's a mutation off of our native Sitka spruce. And it is, it's a spruce. It is very prickly. Uh, typically, typically, these are grafted low. Grafted low. In fact, you can actually grow these from a cutting. Um, and I have a, an older one that's in the uh, garden that actually is about uh, six by six. So they do get to be a big round ball. Um, in some regards, probably too big for many gardens since they do grow large. Uh, classified as a dwarf again, but um, <laughs> they do get big. Uh, so um, they, need, they need some room to grow. Again, not a good plant if you're wanting uh, something next to a sidewalk because they are very prickly. This is a, this makes a really nice low hedge. I would call it kind of semi prickly. This is, if you're familiar with Tan Su, where's my time? I didn't tag this one. Uh, this is a dwarf version of Tan Su. This is a cryptomeria, cryptomeria japonica, uh, what's called the Japanese plume cedars. Um, again, we have a very old one out in the garden. The trunk is probably five inches thick, uh, but this is a dwarf version of that called Kokuria, uh, K-O-K-U-R-Y-A-W, Kokuria. I will, let me show this little dwarf right here. One of the obtuses, um, there are, a, there's lots of obtuses, first of all. This is what's called the true dwarf. Um, Camacyprus, obtusa nana, one of a couple extremely slow growing obtuses. Um, 25 years old will be about 30 by 30 inches. So they are very slow growing. And I say true because there's a lot of 
uh, nanas out there that are in fact are not nanas. Uh, so this is a this is a I suppose you could think of it as a bloodline that we have kept true over the years. So we always put down the true nana. Are there questions? Yeah, are there any questions as a matter of fact? Yes, looks like we um, just got one and I've been generating some as you've gone along. So we've got a question here. Um, you, oh, somebody would like you to remind them what the name was for that prostate um, conifer with the square red tiny cone. Yes, called microcatchus. It's M-I-C-R-O. <laughs> oh, there we go right there. Microcatchus tetragona. I may have misspelled microcatchus. I think that's correct. Micro, microcatchus tetragona, <laughs> excuse me. <coughs> that's a New Zealand native. I was wondering, are a, a lot of the plants that you're showing us today then from other places? Is there a great variety if someone is uh, wanting to um, grow native uh, conifers? Well, you know, I really feel one of the, um, I do very few, I do some ponderosas um, and once in a while, I, you know, a, a, a Doug fir will, will find its way into the nursery. Tiny That's a little ponderosa. ponderosa. Yeah, this is a, this is a little baby ponderosa right there. It's about two years old. <clears throat> I actually just collected those in a person's landscape over in uh, Eastern Oregon that let me come in and just take them up. Um, I don't do a lot of natives because they're all over in the forest. Uh, and pretty much our native conifers get big. Uh, you know, a lot of people, um, uh, you know, I just, I just don't grow them, simple as that. But there certainly are people that do grow them. Um, and, you know, and anytime any person wants to bring in a Doug fir, uh, you know, I'm finding an interesting story uh, with that. Uh, a number of years ago when the University of Oregon football team played Ohio State, the governor, excuse me, the presidents of each university have a bet. And whoever lost that bet had to send the other school a tree. And of course, Oregon lost that football game and I got a call and they wanted to send a Doug Fur to Ohio. And I said, I said, that tree is just, first of all, it grows very fast. And the second, I don't think it survive in Ohio. So I talked them into sending a Chief Joseph. And uh, that is, yeah, Pinus contorta. Pinus contorta. Chief Joseph is a tree that was found in Oregon. And uh, it's the one that turns gold in the winter. And then come April every year turns green again. Uh, but uh, we sent them a five foot uh, Chief Joseph and it's in the, uh, what's it called the president's uh, circle somewhere on the Oregon, uh, Ohio State campus. Interesting sideline. Okay, um, any other questions? Well, yeah, um, actually, and it's about 740. So we've probably got about 20 minutes and then okay. uh, last batch of questions but so I see we've got questions I'm going to save them uh for the end but there was one other question about rootstock what is used for the rootstock in making those standards uh it depends on the genus on the genus um so the rootstock for most spruces is um Abies, excuse me, uh, Picea abies, Norway spruce. That's almost, it, it's grown by the zillions. Uh, that's the rootstock for most of those. For pines, it varies. Some are on balsamea, um, uh, excuse me, that's a balsam fir, that's, uh, uh, that's an abies. Uh, pine, a lot of them are on strobus, pinus strobus. Um, I know a lot of, um, 
as far as the true furs, like the Abies coriana, um, that is the ones I have. A lot of them are on Abies balsamia. I will say if if it's going to be sold in areas that have high humidity, then you want to look at an understock such as Abies nordmaniana or Abies firma. Uh, those two handle the hot, humid conditions much better than balsamia. Uh, but out here, you know, in fact, a lot of growers out here uh, use Abies fraseri too, which is a Christmas tree land. Uh, so out here, you can be pretty flexible on the understock as far as pines, but, that, but if, if it's in an area that's hot and humid, then you have to be very particular, pines and firs, uh, you have to be pretty particular as to what kind of understock. So I hope that answers that. So okay, it's variable. It's a little bit variable, but strobus is used a lot for pines. Oh, okay. Um, and actually, before we go on, here's one more kind of general question, because you've been talking about growth and everything. Um, we've got a question, the top cutting process you showed us, how appropriate is that approach for other conifers? Oh, the nipping it, you mean? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> is that um, a general way that yeah. you can control growth in conifers? Absolutely, yes. Uh, you can pretty much control growth by cutting all the conifers as long as you do it at the right time. Um, let's, let's see if I can see where that one is. Oh man, it's a pine that's par before, which I prune, which keeps his mind as a pine. Um, right there, Val. Karoo, did it say Karoo on it? Yes. Yeah, that's the one. Um, you can do it a couple ways. On a pine, you can do it a couple ways. This is Pinus Karoo. This is a Pinus parviflora. And this one, um, you know, I've got a bunch of these, but one of the ways you can control growth on pines is when they send the new candles out, you can knock them completely back. The first flush, you can knock completely back. And it will send a second flush, but the second flush is going to be shorter because it's already expended some energy sending out that first one. The first flush is usually real long. The other thing that happens by cutting in the first flush, many times it's just one candle. If you knock it off completely, or you can even cut it in half. The second flush tends to be a cluster of growth, like three or five candles. With the, the Karoos, it sent out that first flush, and I just nipped all of them back. I cut them back. I just break them off. And I was looking at these the other day, and I hopefully you can see it at the tips of nearly every single branch. Right here. It has cones. It healed itself and developed cones. So here's an old cone. You can see that old cone right there. It developed cones at the end of almost every single branch. I thought that was pretty neat looking. But I just felt that it was growing faster, container growing, and I had them all, you know, uh, pushed together. It was just growing faster than I wanted it to grow. So again, pines, cut the candles in half, knock them off completely. So a lot of other things, um, this is a juniper, by the way. This is a variegated Hollywood juniper, and I don't have the tag for it, but this is, um, oh gosh, uh, juniper, Juniperus chinensis, Chinese juniper, and um, a Torulusa, excuse me, take that back. That's the old name. Uh, Kaizuka is the uh, corrected name for this now, the variegated Hollywood juniper. And something like this, your um, Chemiciparus, uh, you can pretty well prune back uh, as long as you don't get into hard wood down in the, you know, where there are no, where there's no growth. You can cut it back that far, but it takes a long time to regenerate. So, and, it's, and with pines, you don't want to go back to bare wood. Okay. See, like, now this one should, this is a Camusipers obtusa um, Baldwin variegated. 
Um, you would not want to, you know, cut clear back. Hopefully you can see that. I don't know if you can, but you want to do your cutting up here with, where you have um, a frond, with, you know, some growth to it. And you can cut these, you know, clear back in here, top that off if you want. In fact, you know, in looking at this plant, you could cut this thing in half if you wanted to, and it would be fine. <clears throat> The ones, you know, really, the ones to be real careful with as far as pruning are uh, pines for the most part. You know, you can take uh, taxes, the uh, yews, you can, you can butcher them. Uh, same with hemlocks, you can cut way back and they typically come right back. <clears throat> this is a little gold conifer called um, <laughs> gold fern, golden fern. Uh, really, uh, laciated foliage. Again, if you didn't like that, you could cut that back right there. So again, you're dealing with, you know, foliage is all along the stem. So it would be fine to cut it back into that area. Another obtusa. You can see how variable the obtusas are when it comes to, you know, from that weird little shearman I was showing you. This is an obtusa called lemon thread. Yeah, I don't have a type, Chymocypris obtusa lemon thread. Uh, there's another form of this called golden whirl, kind of thought to be the same plant, but you can see how really contorted that foliage is. Yeah, I'll show that. In fact, let me show this one right here. I don't know if you can see the, there we go. Yep. Yeah, so that's the baby. Okay, this is two years old right here. And this is about eight years old. So again, a very slow growing cryptomeria. Uh, and just as you can see, this forms this globe. Uh, I will say, you can see a little bit of burning. These, in the valley here, it does need afternoon, uh, at least filtered light. Uh, Cryptomeria japonica naptonensis. Uh, very tight. Uh, if you get in too much shade, you lose, uh, you unfortunately lose a lot of the white. It gets kind of subdued. So it's kind of one of those situations that uh, good morning sun, uh, but to, you know, best to have some filtered afternoon sun or it really will burn, especially in these hot summers we've had. But it's a really choice tight. In fact, I have not pruned this plant. That is how it grows all the time. Cryptomeria naptomensis. Yeah. Uh, another Pinus parviflora. Uh, this is Pinus parviflora tanimano uki. And I will say you can find this written about four different ways. Some people combine that, uh, those all three letters, or all three words, but anyway, Tanimana Uki. It's a very slow growing parviflora and the new growth is white. So there's, you can see some of the tufts of right here. The new growth is white, you can see it in Pure white. I grow these in full sun, and and the, as long as they're irrigated, you know, give a drink during the summertime, they're fine. Uh, you know, sometimes it gets really beastly hot; they may burn off a little bit. But I do grow them in full sun. That plant <clears throat> is uh, is very slow growing. It tends to be um, tends to be as wide as high. In fact, typically a little wider than high. Oh, my helper is so good here. Uh, this is this is a very, very choice. Again, this is a standard, although it's very low standard. It's only grafted about five inches high. Um, this is Abies coriana, Korean fir, called Cahoots Icebreaker. This is, came out of Germany. And I will show the top. That is the top of that, if you can see that. And the needles twist. So you'll see that silver, the underside, all this white or this silver and white you see is the underside of the needle. 
So that, and I have some large one of these that I that are grafted three and four feet high. So as that plant ages, it forms just kind of a flat top, slightly, slightly mounded. And some of the heads now are about, I'm going to say 24, 30 inches wide. I have a friend in New Jersey who has one and the head on his is now six feet wide and the trunk is about eight inches. So they've been around for a number of years, uh, but it still is a, uh, just a splendid uh, conifer. I don't know how, how am I gonna hold, do this hold, baby? Hold it in your lap maybe. Let's see if this, uh, does it show up? <laughs> this is a very wild looking plant. This is uh, a cryptomeria. Cryptomeria japonical, <laughs> japonica called Aerocarioides, Aerocarioides right there, A-R-A-U. And it, um, it is pretty fast growing. It's pretty wild growing, as you can see. And actually, I, I typically will gather these all together and nip off the ends. Uh, I do have an old one out here that's about, I'm gonna say it's about eight feet. It does thicken up a bit as it gets older. Uh, but it, you know, in fact, give you an idea. Where are my clippers? You can take these and just cut them off just like that. Oh. And uh, it will be just fine. <laughs> Some people just uh, die when I do that, but it will recover. I usually don't do this at this time of year, but it's not gonna, it's not gonna hurt it. Okay. Besides that, for me, this is a cutting. <laughs> They're kind of hard to strip down. But that's how I start them right there. That's a cutting. Put it in rooting hormone, put it on the heat bench for about three months. These root pretty easily, but that's how we start them is right there. This is another cryptomeria. I just sold one of these. I just sold one about eight feet the other day. This is a Cryptomeria cristata. It's a Cryptomeria japonica cristata. And the unique feature with this Cryptomeria are what's called the cox cones. And there, there's one right there. You can see this, this, uh, if you can see that. Anyway, it looks like a virus, but that's actually just these, uh, uh, very congested foliage that these get. There's another one right there. You can see that. No, it never. Anyway, it does that throughout the whole plant. It gets to be large though. That, that, that'll get 20, 25 feet. So give it room. It's another um, Chemiciprus, but this is a Pacifera. This is okay. Chemiciprus Pacifera. Um, I think it curly tops. And you can see how nice blue, nice blue silver color. By the way, if you have, you know, I'm often asked, are there any conifers that will grow in heavy, wet soils? Hi, Sharon Roberts. Sharon Roberts, do you have a question? No, never mind. <clears throat> and heavy, wet soils. And there is a Camerociparus that grows in heavy, wet soils, and that's thioides. Um, keep in mind the, uh, the swamp cypress is thioides that grows in Florida. Um, and we do grow that. We grow a form called Shiva, which has kind of a just very feathery uh, foliage, very soft, turns kind of a plum color in the winter. Uh, nice bush form, um, uh, chemiciparous that does find in water, or excuse me, in heavier soils and will handle water. <clears throat> Uh, this is a um, um, <laughs> this is a sequoia sempervirens. So this is a sport off of the native redwood, a big tree uh, down on the Oregon coast and into California. This this forms called Henderson's Blue. This is a great example of training a plant to do what you want it to do. Uh, on its own, Henderson's Blue becomes a tree. But you can take this plant and take the leader out, just cut that leader out. 
you ever have an opportunity to come out, we have one in the garden that we've kept at three feet, but it's about, I'm going to say it's probably 10 or 12 feet around and it just drapes down and grows on the ground. It is a spectacular yeah, okay. plant. We've got about oh. two or three minutes. Two or three minutes. Cedrus Diodora called silver mist. I do stake it to get it. Well, some of the Diodoras uh, work better for me to train them initially, get them up in the air, then they can cascade down. This can be a bush form. Hmm. Well, I guess I put that in the water dish. But yeah, it's fine. Uh, Camisiferous obtusophilicoides. This is the green form. Yeah, this is the green form. Uh, we were showing you the golden fern before, so that's the green form of it, right there. You can stop me at any time here, guys. Look at all these cuttings on the floor. If you want a obtusa that has really coarse foliage. This is Camisiprus obtusa satsumi, right there. Really coarse textured foliage. Mark's gonna be mopping the kitchen floor tonight. <laughs> <laughs> oh, let's see here. Is there any, Val, the little, um, right to your right, right to your right, right there, little Morgan. <clears throat> It's a dwarf oriental um, thuya, you know, same genus as pyramidal arborvita and evergreen. This is beautiful. Let's see if I attract an insect here. Uh, beautiful, uh, mostly yellow with the green in it. Um, this came out of Germany. But the interesting thing with this conifer, this is about 10 years old. They're, they only grow about two inches a year. In the winter, and this is what first attracted me to it, it turns red, turns red. Oh, get it. I saw a field of these one time at a big nursery. I fell in love with it. So it goes from this green and gold to this interesting, just interesting red color in the winter. Oops, maybe a show this to you. Thuya orientalis morgan right there. Mark, we're getting on towards eight okay. o'clock and if you've got anything else that you are really dying to show us and like, oh, don't leave that one out. Yeah, you know, um, I, I do have one. I'm, I mean, it's too heavy for Val to lift. So let me get it real quickly here. <clears throat> Sorry, I'm blank there. Oh, goodness gracious, it's too heavy for me to lift. And I'm not going to be able to show you the whole plant, but uh, this, if you can kind of see this, looks good. Okay, this is an obtusa. Now, what you can do. Yeah, Camisiprus obtusa. This particular one is Costeri. With a K. <laughs> oh boy. Just yeah. You know, what what I what I brought this for is if you have a and, and this works with obtusas really well. If you have an old obtusa that has a lot of dye out in it, and this is this was a thick shrub. You can start cleaning them up, pull out all that old foliage, do some creative pruning, and you end up with what's called a Nawaki uh, form conifer. And they are cloud pruned conifer. These little tufts will get larger, each one of them, and you can kind of keep them somewhat separated, just to give them a, you know, like an inch between each one of these little clouds and they become just a really unique looking conifer. So that's what this is, just, a, just an old costeri that I pruned up. 
So anyway, that's, oh, that is heavy. Well, we've got a, a few more questions that have come in and a couple of them have been really specific about uh, individuals, yards and such. Okay. So I want to ask you with, with that kind of question, maybe could we save that for um, the kind of, it sounds like the kind of thing you like to do with gardeners is help them plan what yes. would work in their garden. Yeah. So and, yeah, um, whether they'd want to visit or if they wanted to email me either way. Okay. So anybody that's got a real specific question, let's maybe uh, ask you to do that and work with Mark on that kind of question. But um, there's a couple of others that have come up about, is there a certain time of the year to prune that, is there a, a good time or can you do it any time? Well, certainly like I was doing the cryptomeria uh, where I whacked it off. Uh, it's fine to do it. It's not gonna hurt it, but it's not gonna push any new growth at this point. Uh, and, but typically I do my pruning when, you know, essentially when the juices are flowing, uh, we're done with a hard freeze. So realistically, you know, I do my pruning probably mid May. I like to cut off the pruning of anything. Uh, I always I use July 4th, a holiday. Uh, to cut off in, in that time, even with uh, things like rhododendrons and azaleas, uh, that allows them time to push new growth, and it's same with the conifers, to push new growth and have that new growth harden off before we get a hard freeze. If that, if you do it really late and you push that new growth and you get a hard freeze, it's going to, it's going to kill it all, it's going to knock it all back. And it may in fact kill the whole plant. So you do want to uh, do it early on. Okay, we've got a question too, where somebody's asked about keeping trees in pots. I don't know if they're specifically referring to conifers and they pot up, but they're curious about what, when should they worry that, that they're gonna kind of get strangled in that pot? Um, we we repot every two years. Uh, so, you know, we start, our conifers from cuttings. Actually, you know, they go from a cutting bed, a rooted cutting, we put them in liters. Although a lot of times we could go right to a gallon, but I tend to put them in liters. <clears throat> These are two years old, so they'll go into gallons. And so it, it's about a two year thing. So we go from a gallon, we like to, as far as an up size, we like to double the size of the pot. So we'll go from a one to a two, um, sometimes a three, but from a two, I typically go to a five and then from a five to a 10, that kind of thing. And obviously at some point you have to stop and hopefully you sell the plant before then, but we do have 150 gallon pots out here. So give you, give you an idea of uh, some really large things. But um, the other thing with container gardening Obviously they need to have more frequent water, whatever you're growing in a container, than if it's in the ground. If it's a, if it's a plant that you're going to have in the container year round, uh, know what can survive in the winter in that container. Uh, when you grow, the big difference here, when you have a, uh, let me think of something. If, let me think, let's take a juniper. When you have a juniper in a container and winter rolls around and we have cold winter winds below freezing and we have a wind with it, it will kill most junipers, which you would not think it would kill a juniper. It will kill a juniper. In the ground, it's fine because for the, for the roots to be affected, in the ground, it's got to essentially, you know, be a permafrost kind of thing to kill the roots when they're in a landscape. But when they're in the container and that wind hits the side of that pot, it's essentially sucking the moisture out. So it's, it's freeze drying the roots. So if you've got a plant in a container that's possibly susceptible to the, it is more the wind than the cold. But the wind is just like, uh, what's it called? What's that called? No, it, with humans, what's that called? 
windshield? Windshield, windshield. It's just the <laughs> windshield factor with, with plants. It's the same kind of thing. That wind against that small root zone just, just dries them out. And so they can't take up moisture. The only plants that I have found that are truly hardy in a container in the worst of winters are pines and spruce. I have never lost either one of those in the worst of winters in containers. Everything else I cover in the winter. I put, you know, we cover the uh, greenhouses with uh, with uh, crop cover or um, this weed or whatever it be. So everything else I protect. Now I know there are a lot of people that have uh, their canicipras uh, outside too. Um, I just tend to shelter mine. Okay. Huh, okay. Um, are there kind of any general rules or, or tips for training uh, conifers? If you're really trying to get a particular growth pattern. Well, you know, if you're looking more at the uh, garden bonsai or a true bonsai, um, you know, a lot of people work with copper wire to actually train. Now, the one I was showing you, that, uh, that's how that plant was. Uh, so, you know, I'm just, the main thing I did with that obtusa is got rid of all the older dead foliage um, uh, on that plant. So I certainly could with wiring, stiff wiring, create a, an angle that, you know, isn't natural, uh, just like you would do with a bonsai kind of thing. Um, uh, you know, and <clears throat> the other side of that, if a plant needs staking, uh, I, had, I did show you that one uh, Cedrus deodora that I'm training upright. Um, and once that hardens off, that's fine. Uh, you know, I have some older um, uh, weeping larch. You know, larches tend to be grafted high and then they cascade back down. And I've got some that are actually grafted at six feet that will cast, slowly cascade back down. So, uh, but initially that has to be staked to form that uh, stiff trunk. Uh, hopefully that answered that question. If not, that, that person can certainly email me. All righty. And another, uh, two more questions that have come up and then probably we're getting on towards time. Um, somebody asked about a particular plant and whether you propagate that from cuttings. So I'm gonna generalize it. Can really everything you've shown today been propagated from from cuttings? No, none of the pines. Oh, uh, none of the pines. Um, let's see here. And I will say I've had min, uh, limited success. Let's see here. If there's anything else? Yeah. The the question was specifically about a Cryptomira japonica. But oh so yeah, yeah. I I propagate all those from cuttings. Okay. Uh, but. Um, but the pines are impossible. I, I will say I did a calicedrus, uh, which is the incense cedar. Uh, there's a gold form called Barima gold. Uh, I put up 50 of them and got one to root. That's why that plant is grafted. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, some things work pretty well, some things not so well. It's also oh. time, it's all the time of year. It's it's best to do conifers after we've had a hard freeze. That's the that's the uh, so you know would I stick this at this point? Yeah, maybe not, because apparently we're getting some cold weather in here in another week or so or something like that. So anyway, that's a that's a hard freeze before you do your conifer cuttings. I do conifer cuttings clear into December. Oh, okay. Well, and then let's finish up one last question here. Um, somebody's asked whether you're aware of any evolutionary explanation for the blue color that some of these plants have. Mm. That's a really good question. And I've never been asked that question. <laughs> never been asked. But I will say this. <clears throat> Most likely, that just, just like that Korean um, fur, that icebreaker, Kahoot's icebreaker, I mean, that is probably not seen in, in that intensity, that intense silver color in a normal Korean fur stand. 
It has been very simply a sport, again, the mutation mm -hmm. off of a plant that may have shown some different kind of color. And that was um, propagated, whether it be graft or cutting. Uh, and maybe it, in fact, went ahead and sported uh, to achieve it. It's not uncommon for a sport to sport again. Mm -hmm. And uh, so, you know, some of this, some of these colors are not found in nature. If you, if you planted a bunch of seedling uh, Colorado blue spruce, you're going to see lots of different colors of greenish blue, lots of different colors. Same with the forest. Uh, so, and then you select the bluest form and then you propagate from that. Oh, okay. Oh, actually one last question has come in that's uh, just kind of a general technique question. Um, how do you protect the grafted location on a plant in the winter? So once you've done a graft, do you do anything special to protect that through that first winter? Yeah, the first winter, it would be best to have that plant under cover. Again, um, you know, we use clear plastic or the white plastic because uh, that's still pretty tender. As, you know, if you got, still have the rubber band on it, the uh, rubber strip, uh, you don't want that to freeze. So it would be best to be protected, uh, you know, whether it be even in the back porch, that kind of thing, if you're having, if we're having really cold weather. Okay. Well, this has been wonderful. I think it's been very much appreciated. We've got some comments of, wow, this is really cool. <laughs> so, well, it's been unique. And like Val said, I've got uh, you know, between me and the wood stove, there's about 100 conifers. So, <clears throat> yes, it's uh, yeah, going to involve a little cleanup before we, <laughs> when we leave tonight. And I have well, all my tags we right really here on the, on the <laughs> table. <laughs> yeah. We really appreciate all the effort you put into this because I, in talking with you the last few weeks, I know with the fire, the time of year, the internet and everything, it's, it's really, I, I really appreciated that you were willing to keep at this because it is a, a tough time of year for you. And, um, and I think also, I hope everybody's taken away a sense of there's a lot of ways to use conifers in your garden. And maybe rather than just like me kind of thinking, oh, it'd be nice to have a pine type thing there, go out and really talk with you or uh, talk with folks who know conifers because it sounds like you really want to pick and choose carefully. And um, so that you have a landscape that um, matures well. Yeah, yeah, that's true. All righty. Well, Thank you. Oh, and Patty Driscoll says, great to see you. Oh, uh, <laughs> that's great. Thank you. Patty was here tonight. <laughs> so um, with that, thank you to Val and Mark and all the trees that are now indoors, maybe for the evening. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> Enjoy that warm night inside. Thank and, you very much, Sharon. Um, thank you, everybody who's attended this year, and we'll see you all again starting in 2021. Okay. Thank you very much, Mark. Goodbye. Good night. Good night.